everybody. I'm Stu Wagstaff. Welcome to the Pressbooks Monthly Product Update. It is January of 2024. Um, the first thing that I want to share has to do with some large-scale uh, rebuilding, refactoring work that we've been doing with the Pressbooks LTI provider. And uh, in rebuilding Pressbooks LTI, we've kind of rebuilt it from the ground up. And one of the big uh, focuses has been just making the LTI plugin easier to configure for network administrators and LMS admins, and then easier to use by instructors. And what I want to start is by showing a new feature called dynamic registration and how that works to simplify the initial registration of the Pressbooks network as a tool with your LMS as a platform. The dynamic registration is supported by three of the four major LMSs. So it works with Moodle, it works with D2L, and it works with Blackboard. Canvas doesn't support dynamic registration right now, but it does support the use of a JSON URL, which I think we showed in the last meeting. But if people have questions about that, I can show that. What I want to show today is how you can how you would be able to register your Pressbooks network as a LTI tool with Moodle. And I'll use Moodle as an example because it's an open source LMS that I have easy access to. This would be the step that you would take if you were a Moodle LMS administrator. You'd come in to click Site Administration. You'd then click Plugins. In Moodle, it's called an external tool, and there's a Manage Tools link. Here, Moodle gives you a nice little interface that lets you add your tool URL. So in this case, I know the URL for my network. So it's press LTI dev pressbooks.network. And then the endpoint is format LTI registration. At this point, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. You just click add LTI advantage. And what this is doing is we're communicating now with the Pressbooks endpoint and saying, hey, there is an LMS out there that would like to register your network as a tool in its environment. And so we provide a little interface that says you're about to register a Pressbooks network as a new LTI tool. Click the register button to confirm. I click the register button, I confirm. And then it says you've successfully registered the Pressbooks network, Pressbooks development network for LTI as a new LTI tool. To use the tool registration, a network manager has to activate the press platform in Pressbooks. So I'm gonna close this and you'll see here in Moodle, I've got a new pending tool registration. If I want, I can go ahead and add, I'm gonna just add a couple of settings right now that will enable um, deep linking, which I'll show later. I'm gonna show it in the activity chooser. I'm gonna say that it supports deep linking and I'm gonna go ahead and just add that as my content selection URL. So those were the steps that were needed for this to be configured on the Moodle side. I'll now show you in Pressbooks, you'll have a big list of all of the LTI platforms. When a new platform is registered, you'll see here's a brand new platform that's just been registered with my Pressbooks network. It included all of the information that Moodle needed to give me. And you can see by default, it's not active. So anyone can use the dynamic registration, but the Pressbooks network administrator needs to look at this and say, um, is this actually someone I want to give access to my Pressbooks network, the LTI? In this case, I just did it so that I know I do want to add it. So the only step I need to take is click active and click save changes. So on this, this point here, I've now activated this Moodle instance to have an LTI connection to my Pressbooks network via that entering the URL in Moodle and activating on the Pressbooks side. The other thing that I can do in Moodle is I didn't activate it, it's pending, so I'm gonna go ahead and say activate. This LTI configuration is now complete. And what's nice about that is it took me, I don't know, two or three minutes while I was talking to show you the whole configuration of that tool. Um, a similar process exists for Blackboard and for D2L and a comparable but slightly different process exists for Canvas. So we're hopeful that what this will do is it just will make it a lot easier for your LMS administrators to get Pressbooks configured and for you as a network manager to see and decide who you want to approve. We think this will be especially valuable if you're in a, a situation where you have many institutions all trying to connect via LMS to your Pressbooks network, like your consortia, or if you have multiple LMSs or if you've used an LMS where it's been hard to coordinate with your LMS administrator for whatever reason, 
the dynamic registration should make that process a lot faster and smoother. All right, so now I want to show from the instructor point of view. Historically, one of the ways that you can bring content in from press books to your LMS was through the use of common cartridges, and that's still supported. So if I were to go to, um, we've simplified this process a little bit so that there's only one option and it's always easy to use. But if you click export for a given book, you would have the ability to make a common cartridge with LTI links. What this will do is it will give you a zip file with all of the individual links to specific content in your book that you can then bring in and import into your course and it will turn them into LTI links. That's a process that requires someone to go into Pressbooks to make an export to come into the LMS to do the import and then it's all done. And it saves a lot of time rather than doing them one by one. But there is a smoother and an even easier process for instructors that will now be supported. It's called deep linking. And so in, I'll show you in Moodle what this looks like. I have an empty course in Moodle. I've turned editing on for the course. And here I'm gonna just click add an activity or resource. From this list of choices, you'll see there's a new Pressbooks tool. This was the LTI tool that I registered earlier. If I select this tool and then pick select content in Moodle, it will bring up a modal that shows me all of the Pressbooks content on that network that I have editor, author, author, editor, or administrator access to. And so there's a book here and I could say, let's add these two chapters from this book and bring them in to Moodle. So I select the content. It's saying, okay, it's gonna add some new external tools. Yep, that's what I wanna do. And here I click save and return to course. And now I've got two new LTI links that have just been brought into my course via deep linking. If I were to launch and open this, this is what it would look like in Moodle. There'd be a new Pressbooks chapter here that's just the live version of this chapter is linked and will load just a second here in Moodle. So here's that chapter that's just been loaded within the Moodle interface. A very, very similar process exists for, actually identical process exists for Canvas, for Blackboard, and for D2L. And the deep linking, the feature is really just going to give you, a, or an instructor, a, a simple selector that they have that lets them pick the content that they want to bring into the LTI so that you don't have to bother with manually importing chapters or even doing the common cartridge import. So those are the, the new features. We just today um, went through the certification suite and, final, and are finalizing that with one ed tech. And so the new LTI plugin is we're going through the final stages of testing and release. And we will be upgrading or migrating all of you or all of our, our Pressbooks clients to use the new LTI plugin. The idea would be that it would be a no effort migration or upgrade for you. If you've already configured things, the configuration will work in exactly the same way. If you've already brought in LTI links, they'll work in exactly the same way. The, the steps that I just shown you would be things that you could use or do if you haven't already configured LTI or if you haven't already brought LTI links into a given course or a book. So that's what's happening on the LTI front. And um, I'll pause there and take any questions. Oh, okay, so Cheryl asked, can deep linking work for a book on another Pressbooks network? Well, uh, yes and no. In order to, to set up deep linking, you have to have an LTI configuration between your LMS and that Pressbooks network. So in theory, yes. If let's say an instructor wanted to deep link to a book, let's say there was an instructor at uh, the University of Oregon that wanted to link to a book on your network at the University of Arizona, Cheryl. Sure. If you as the University of Arizona network manager wanted your whole network to be connected to Oregon's LMS, then you and Oregon could work out a, a situation where they registered your Pressbooks network as an LTI tool, they approved it, and you said, yeah, that's fine with me if Oregon's LMS is connected to our Pressbooks instance. In that case, they could then use the selector. I think what's most, most commonly going to be the case, though, is one institution's LMS will want to connect to their Pressbooks network. And if there was a book from another network that you wanted to deep link, you would probably then just clone or copy the book to your network and then make the link from your network. 
Did that, did that answer your question or was that more confusing? No, it does. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought about the cloning option, but then that would count against our number of books in the new tiered pricing system. So we're trying to avoid cloning now. I see. Yeah, so um, the other question for Kathy is, can a book be integrated into more than one university's LMS? Definitely, uh, provided that you've approved the LTI integration on both sides, on the Pressbook side and on the LMS side. Okay, so like as Sherilyn and I, if my faculty were using one of her books on her platform and her faculty were as well, she and I could work out a thing where we could each have a faculty member as administrator and it's not going to freak out either LMS or the book to have it deep linked in two different institutions? No. Yeah. Okay. So, so for example, on our test network, we have the same Pressbooks network connected to Moodle, Canvas, Blackboard, D2L, and we could have it connected to seven different Canvas instances at seven different institutions. Like That's pretty common for a consortial situation where you've got a, a book that's shared by 20 campuses and each one of those campuses has an LTI connection. And that same book will link just fine as, as long as you've approved the LTI connection between what's called the tool and the platform. The tool in this case is your Pressbooks network and the platform is any LMS. So there's no limit on the number of platforms or LMSs that can be registered with your tool. The biggest constraint is just working out the permissions between your LMS administrator and your Pressbooks network administrator to allow those LTI connections to exist. Any other questions about LTI or how that how it works or what it would what it would do? If deep linking isn't essential to you, you obviously can continue doing the old common cartridge with web links, and you don't need to have an LTI connection for that to work. Or if the book is public, Cheryl, you can simply just put a link to the public book in your course and it launches as an external link rather than an LTI link, and there's no, no limitation on that. You don't. The, the major benefit of LTI is it loads securely in the LMS and it handles user authentication and registration. So it's especially useful if you have private content because then the user's authenticated and given permission to view it. With public content, it's mainly just a convenience of loading in the iframe, but... Uh, LTI has other advantages too down the road, I think. All right. Um, so that was the thing I wanted to share with LTI. The second major change that we made uh, has to do with glossary terms. And what we wanted to do was we were looking at glossary terms and we we're looking at the way that they displayed and we realized there were some barriers to accessibility for how glossary terms were working. And so we revamped the glossary term selector and the glossary term display for improved accessibility. And so here, I'll show you, we built a new pattern and have implemented it. I'm going to give you an example book. In Pressbooks, I think most people know how to create glossary terms, but if you've made a glossary term and linked it, you'll see a glossary term will usually be indicated with a dashed line underneath it. So now I'm going to move to my browser and I'm using the keyboard and I'm navigating and you can see keyboard navigation. I'm targeting or highlighting the various glossary terms. Just using entirely my keyboard, I'm going to click enter and I'm going to open the glossary. Uh, sorry. And what you'll see, I've got too much happening here. Let me, uh, let me select a glossary term. And then you'll notice as I enter and select it, you'll see a modal pop up that includes the term and it will read out the description of the term. And then it has a little box that lets me shift focus. I can either click the X or I can press escape. When I do that, it closes the modal and it returns focus back to the term that was just selected. So it's now fully navigable like by keyboards and by screen readers, and the users are able to open terms. Focus is shifted there. It's clearly announced to the screen reader, and then when you close a term, your focus is returned back to the text where the term was selected. So it's just a change to the pattern used for glossary terms, but it was a, an issue that was reported to us by users in Washington that it was hard for users of assistive technology, particularly of screen readers, to track where they were and to see what was happening when glossary terms were opened. So we just changed the pattern that's being used and you can now see it's all keyboard navigable and follows better accessibility practices for glossary terms. Any questions for me about glossary terms, how they're used and any of the accessibility features that we just added? 
Um, there were a couple other minor bug fixes and accessibility things that have been released in the last couple of months. I won't go through them in great detail, but if anybody has questions about bugs or issues that they've noticed, we can discuss those sort of towards the end. One of the big things we've been talking to people about has been how to help uh, better support multi-institution installations of Pressbooks or situations where many institutions are sharing a single Pressbooks network. This happens most frequently with consortia or university systems. Uh, eCampus Ontario is a very large provincial organization that has many different campuses sharing a single Pressbooks installation. And they approached us saying, we'd like uh, better tools for managing and getting visibility into institutional use. And one of the particular challenges they had was in Pressbooks, there's really just one powerful admin role. It's the network administrator. They have a couple of network administrators, but they have so many institutions using the network that they wanted to be able to delegate those responsibilities. They really wanted to have an institutional manager role where that person would be able to administer books and users, but only the books and users that belonged to a given institution. And that simply wasn't possible uh, as Pressbooks was initially built. And so we've begun designing and thinking about how we can add support for multi-institutional indicating which institution a book and a user belongs to, how to manage those things, and how to create a new institutional manager role. We're at the design phase, and we've been working with all of our consortial Pressbooks clients to work on the designs. And I'm going to hand it over to Michelle to kind of show some of the prototypes and the wireframes that we've built before we actually build the features. We have some prototypes and wireframes to show, and we're at the gathering feedback stage of this process. So Michelle, if you'd jump us in, jump in and uh, take it away. Thank you. All right. So uh, we've been working on a prototype, as Deal said, for this. Uh, and as such, the main part is that uh, we've developed this sort of new institutions uh, subheading. And so underneath that, um, we will have the institution list. You can add your institutions and then assign the users and books that you previously had to those institutions to better organize all of it. On this page, you can see this is what it looks like when you have filled out an institution. So you have their name, the email domains that are associated with it, the institutional managers that would also be in charge of their uh, institution uh, and what the book and user limits are that you would prescribe to each of them. Um, along with this, uh, in order to get one of these entries in, you would have to add it. So you can do it by clicking the add new button or just coming into the sub navigation to add an institution. So here it gives you a few tips about adding that in, uh, including their name, those domains, um, uh, institutional managers. Uh, they would have to show up already as existing users to, to come up. Uh, and then book limit and user limits will be defined basically by press books uh, in concert. Um, so they're not accessible by the network managers, but uh, they are changeable, of course. Um, and once you have added an institution, they would show up here. Um, the other parts are assigning users. So all of the users would show up. But first, when they show up, they'll show up as unassigned. And so you would need to go through the list, uh, select them either probably by uh, just looking at the email domains. And then you can set the institution. Uh, and then that way, they can all be assigned under a particular institution. And that goes similarly for books as well. Uh, so the book administrators would show up uh, and then you are able to uh, add the institution just by selecting one of the items and then, of course, setting your institution to the one that it would be assigned to. And that is what all of the new features are that we are adding. There are additional sort of knock on effects. Uh, so you will have different views, uh, whether you are an institutional manager or a network manager. So this is what the network manager would see. It's the same as it always shows up. But in this instance, there will also be now an institution um, tab as well as an institution uh, column so that you can see uh, how everything is applied uh, across the entire site. Same goes with users. Now you can see exactly where they are and you're able to filter that through these lists. The stats page will also include um, an institution column as well. 
Uh, and if you are one of these institutional managers, you have like a limited subset of actions that you can take, but you can now see all of your books and all of your users. Steele, I'll pass it to you. Is there anything else you'd like to mention or any questions? Yeah, first, I think any, just any questions. Thanks for that really helpful walkthrough. No questions about this in the chat so far. So this is this is big work that we're engaged in right now. Um, our, it will be probably our, actually it will be definitely our primary obsession between now and the end of March when we have scheduled to deliver this work. You can see the wireframes are fairly well advanced. We're beginning development work on this right now. And our main focus will be shipping these features incrementally and making sure that the relevant institutions that have consortial interest see and understand and can use these features. The only other thing that I wanted to explain is that um, how the institutional manager role is conceived. Essentially, if Michelle, if you could open up that Figma screen again and show the institutional manager dashboard, I just want to pause and set a couple of things here. So the first thing that um, if you are a network manager, so if many of you are network managers, you'll see a, a typical dashboard. And if we can show the network manager dashboard first, the network manager, when they visit their dashboard, you can see there's that block at the top that shows you the homepage. It tells you information about the whole network. It lets you explore the stats page for the entire network. And then there's a series of actions that you can take. On the left-hand side of the menu, you'll see books, users, institution, appearance, pages, et cetera. These are all things that network managers can do for the entire network. They can update the homepage and they can administer the network. The major difference for an institutional manager is that they're even they're more constrained. There's a bunch of things that only network managers should be able to do. So the idea for the institutional manager is they will see a block that just tells them about usage for their institution. So rather than the network has a thousand books and 2000 users, they'll say, my institution has 250 books and 103 users. When they click explore stats, there will be a custom stats page that shows them books, users, page views, downloads, all those things only for the books and users tagged or belong to their institution. So it would be a subset of the entire network. And then in terms of what they can see, they will be able to see just a book list and a user list and their book list and user list, rather than being the 252 books overall, it will show them here are the 29 books that are owned by or belong to your institution. It's similar to the, the role of a network manager, but just constrained to be just stuff that's relevant to them. So it's kind of like a little sub-account, I guess you would just describe it as, within the network. Otherwise, their, their capabilities and their functionality will be very similar to what a network manager can do, just within a, a smaller domain. So institutional level admins, for example, Kathy, let's say there is a book and the authors are having problems and they need somebody to go in and help them turn on a plugin or activate something. The institutional manager, if that book is assigned to their institution, can do everything that you can do as a network manager. They can edit the book, they can help add users, they can delete users, they can administer the book. You can as well as a network manager, but you could also say, hey, institutional manager, you handle this one because they, that they're a user at your institution and that's a book that belongs to your institution, all yours. Um, they can also see the Google, they could, yes, they can see and configure Google Analytics. They can also see and configure the Cocoa Analytics or the user stats or book stats that are available uh, at the book or the institutional level. So that's what's coming and um, we're really excited about that. I think Mary is probably excited most of all. And um, we hope to share some more updates and then by the end of February to show you working software in production that's related to that. Yeah, I go ahead. Question. I have a question totally unrelated to anything you talked about. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I was just looking at Books and I'm, I, I guess this is a bit of a troubleshooting question because maybe folks here have run across this. If you look at the statistics for a book and you'll have like really good usage and then there'll be one day where it's zero and then it moves on to have, you know, pretty good usage. Has anyone come across that? And then is it really just as simple as no one looked at it that day? Um, when you say usage, are you, can, can you just, are you talking about like the 
number of page views collected in Cocoa Analytics? That's right, yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Um, I would say probably what's happening is that there's a, a like what's supposed to be a cron job that's regularly collecting those and updating those every day. If there's a zero, it probably means that the cron job didn't run as it was supposed to run on that day. And then it maybe ran the next day and the next day was twice as high. If you're seeing that, or you're seeing weird collection issues like that, that's a good idea to just email premium support and show us, here's the book, here's the weird thing we're seeing. And that's something that we can investigate because we want to make sure that the the numbers are more accurate at the level of the day. And if it's if you're getting a zero for an otherwise active book, it probably means that something failed with the collection and we should look into that on our infrastructure level. We'll do. Yeah, that's what happened. You can see the next day that the numbers double. So that, that's like probably, so probably it missed it somehow missed something yeah. missed there. And I don't know what would have happened, but we can definitely investigate that if you know more about it. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Kel. Is there anything that anyone wanted to ask me about or that wanted to ask about either bugs that you've experienced or features that you're interested in or problems that you've been encountering that you wanted to bring to our attention? I I do. Sure. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Um, so I've been, um, talking to Thomas, actually, he's been helping me sort through an analytics question. Um, and that is that, um, as we're using the LTI maybe in our LMS, um, we're curious how to look at statistics on how much use is going through the LMS. Totally. And so I think... Um, we're, uh, I'm just wondering if there is an easier way than going book by book and looking at the referrers list, if that yes. makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, so Liz, this is something that we've just been talking about as we've been rebuilding the LTI plugin. Can you tell me what kind of usage statistics are you most interested in knowing and, and how would you want them presented? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I think what we would be interested in knowing is, or initially what we would be interested in knowing is um, aggregate, are we seeing a lot of usage through the LMS? Yeah. And, um, but I think we would also like to see how it breaks down by the book and by the course. Totally. Um, but um, to begin with, um, that, that, uh, we wouldn't need that initially. Like, I think we would just need the aggregate data to begin with. Yeah. The things that I'm imagining people would want to know would be, so let's say you have a generic LTI connection established and you'd probably want to know at first, like how many courses or contexts has it been used in? Yes. So let's say it's 157 courses have at least one LTI link to Pressbooks. And then probably I think we'd want to know how many students or users accessed or maybe how many times they launched each one of those links. Those are some of the basic counting stats that I think we'll provide for the new plugin or that we're imagining. Okay. We, we do want to talk with you and other people that are using LTI to be like, what information do you want visibility into? And then also we want to know because we need to understand how LTI is being used so that we can make sure that we're doing the right thing for the people who are using heavily and also figure out if people have it activated but aren't using it, is there a reason why and what can we do to help them use it more effectively? So and do you see that being a report that we would request from Pressbooks or would that be something that we would be able to do on our end? I don't know. Well, it depends on the LMS you're using and I'm not okay. sure what, I don't know the answer uh, okay. in terms of, uh, are you, I think you're a Canvas school, is that Canvas. right? Canvas, yeah. yes. Canvas may already have information about LTI tool integrations is, I, I don't know. And I just don't know enough about what else. So this is learning that I'd like to do. Yeah. From our side, we know information about LTI links because we, whenever they're made, we respond to them by launching the link. We could certainly say, okay, just keep track of these numbers. And that's the direction that we'd be trending towards. We'd probably put that in the dashboard for you. Okay. There's still some research questions I think we need to answer. Um, I agree that that's valuable information to have and we want to satisfy that need for you so thank you for bringing that up oh i'm very excited that you're looking into it thank you yeah uh hopefully that will be something that's if not part of the initial release part of something that we add very soon after the lti upgrade so that we can Great. use ability to that anybody else have something they wanted to bring up or ask about um i have a question sort of for the group maybe um okay. 
Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about, um, we, we've been doing a lot of analytics stuff recently, and I've been thinking about adding a privacy policy to our Pressbooks site. And if other people have privacy policies they really like or have thought about the best ways to talk to their users and faculty and students about privacy on Pressbooks. So I just sort of wanted to bring that up as a topic, if this is a good space for that. This is Kathy at Oklahoma State. We have a framework, we can't call it policy, because it's not law and it's specific to our teaching and learning team. It was written by Christina Calhoun, but I'll, I'll grab it and drop it in the chat for you. Hi, that may also be a good question to just ask in the community forum of other network managers. I know I've seen some stuff in the past. I think UC Berkeley has one in place and I think maybe Lauren at University of Washington might've done some work on this. I don't remember who else has, but it's it's been a while. Um, before I jump into the round table, I also wanna mention there are three upcoming events that will be of interest potentially for you and your users. Um, we have these regular training webinars, the Getting Started with Pressbooks webinar and the Advanced Pressbooks Publishing. These are often for end users who want to back with the people who want to create their first books. The Getting Started with Pressbooks webinar is on February 5th from 3 to 4 Eastern Time. The Advanced Pressbooks Publishing one will be on February 14th from 2 to 3 Eastern Time. We also have a really special webinar that's kind of a one-off um, that's in a new series. And this one's called Mapping Your OER Journey. And our marketing team is, uh, was we did a, a lot of really good work to make this happen. Arid, is this something you'd like to say anything about or would you like me to introduce it and talk about the topic? Sorry, I just shared the link about the uh, webinar and feel free to share more information about that. Okay, great. So uh, it's gonna be on February 7th um, from noon to one Eastern time. And it's called Mapping Your OER Journey. So if you've been following our blog or following the conference season, uh, Julie Curtis uh, recently published like a OER maturity model after a bunch of conversations with lots of you talking about like where people are in their ma maturity level with open educational publishing. And so we put together a panel of, of some really interesting people from our community. So, so Jonathan Lashley from the state of Idaho. Many of you know Jonathan from his work at, at lots of different places. Ariana Santiago from the University of Houston and then Abby Elder from uh, Iowa State. And they're all going to be talking about charting progress, navigating challenges, and then building and demonstrating impact for your publishing program. I think this will be a real interest for almost everybody who I know that's doing open publishing, and especially those of you that are using Pressbooks as your platform. So if you haven't registered now, please do. It's a free webinar. And if you know of other people who are either just getting started with open publishing or are thinking about developing a program and want to just do some conceptual work before they dive in. This would be a really great panel or topic. And so we'd encourage you to register and attend and um, see you there, hopefully. That's all that I wanted to share on the webinar front and upcoming events. I'd love to open up the time. I'll pause the recording and say, this is your time. It's the community roundtable. Anything that you've been working on, that you've been doing, or that you'd like to share um, that you're proud of or that you want others to know about. Thanks everybody for coming and for your contributions. I uh, really appreciate all that you do for open publishing and to support press with your institutions. We will see you again next month in February. Bye for now.